Hello and welcome to Let's Talk, a series of award-winning podcasts produced and delivered by the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation. Each podcast focuses on an issue related to addiction, from prevention and research to treatment and trends, current events, advocacy, and of course, recovery from a substance use disorder. I'm your host, William Moyers, and today I'm proud to introduce our guest, President and CEO Mark Mishik. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, William. I'm glad to be here. Glad you're here, too. Hard to believe you've been the President and CEO now for 12 years. It's amazing. Time flies when you're having a good time. And, of course, we could look back yep. on that retrospective, but we want to look forward here in, right. in, in the future of, of, of addiction treatment. And, and here we are at the Betty Ford Center uh, in, in the winter of 2020. Um, and uh, this podcast hopefully will have a nice long shelf life, so we'll have to look out even further than just the next couple of weeks. Right. But what do you see in the years ahead when it, when it relates to what we at Hazel and Betty Ford will be delivering in terms of treatment? Well, it, it's a great question. Um, there will be, I think, tremendous changes coming in the field, um, in the clinical model, um, in the way we deliver care. And I think where you're going to see a lot of change has to do with virtual care and telehealth. Now, virtual care, or telehealth's been around for many, many years, and it's been delivered in a lot of different settings. What hasn't happened, though, is the uh, treatment world, uh, the treatment of substance use disorders, uh, hasn't really grabbed onto it uh, the way it's going to happen in the future. Um, the, the population that's coming up, um, the, young, the young men and women who will be moving into work, who will be uh, suffering from substance use disorders in the future, have a very different way of approaching the world than you and I do. Mm -hmm. They use their phones. They use their devices. They are comfortable on them. And so how we meet them, meet our patients where they're at in the future, part of that has to be that we are very good at and understand what parts of the care that we delivered can be delivered virtually? What parts of the care that we deliver can be delivered over a telephone? Um, how can our uh, uh, patients access content, access lectures uh, on demand? That's going to be really critically important going forward. So, that, so that's one thing that's going to happen. The second thing that's going to happen is that um, I really do believe we're in a, a stage now where we're going to have a real shaking out of the field. I think that um, because of the uh, requirements to invest in electronics, uh, electronic health record, mm -hmm. to invest in virtual care, to upgrade your facilities, um, to participate in health insurance, a lot of the treatment centers out there won't be able to do that. They don't have the capital to do it. They don't have the, uh, the expertise to be able to move into the insurance world. And so I think we're going to see a lot of uh, centers that are going to close or merge. What that'll do for us is it's going to put even a heavier demand for our services. We are going to see, uh, as we're seeing today, uh, a continued escalation of people coming to us for care and service. So this organization is going to need to invest in, of all things, bricks and mortar. There's no question about it. Um, and we've got a plan here for the Betty Ford Center. We've got plans throughout the organization for the next five years. But looking well into the future, um, people uh, attending treatment in person is not going away. It's the preferred modality. Um, you know, addiction is a disease of isolation. Yes. So people need, whenever possible, to come in person. Um, and so there'll be a high demand on our, uh, on our sites to be able to provide more and more care. No question about it. One of the things that's happened in the evolution even of the way we deliver care is that there has been an, a, a, a surge under your leadership in outpatient. Can you right. talk more about the role that outpatient will play in the future? Sure. Our, our chief medical officer, uh, Dr. Marvin Seppla, told me when I first started here that 90% of the people who get care for a substance use disorder do it on an outpatient basis. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we really had no outpatient services. So I'm pleased to say today, sitting here this morning, about uh, of four patients, uh, three of them are getting services on an outpatient basis now in the organization, and one out of four are getting it on a residential basis. And that's the way that it should be. So outpatient is critically important for access for people to be able to uh, get care in their neighborhoods, where they live, for an affordable price. And that's what outpatient allows us to do. What about uh, the use of, of medications and the use of, of perhaps other forms of, of therapy uh, going forward? Do you see that there'll be more of a role for, for that in, in, in an organization like ours? I, I hope so. Um, we have to continually evolve our clinical model. 
Um, we can never rest on our laurels. Uh, there's huge, uh, wonderful work going on on brain science right now to understand the biochemistry of addiction. And hopefully uh, this will result in new treatment modalities. It'll result in perhaps uh, even more effective medications to help with craving, for example. Right now, there's really not a medication to help with methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. um, that would be great if, if something came along to help with the, the intense cravings that methamphetamine um, users, addicts, substance uh, who, who are um, addicted to that substance use. And so I would hope, um, as we go into the future, we're going to see more and more uh, new therapies, advances, and continue to, to uh, enhance our clinical model. We're never done. Um, right. Hopefully we're always moving <laughs> forward and always doing a better job of understanding what it takes to get sober. And on that point, what about the role that the 12 steps play? I mean, when we were born in 1949 in, in Center City, Minnesota, it was in a model that, uh, that included the 12 steps. Those 12 steps hang on the wall of every one of our facilities, whether it's outpatient, residential. Uh, we give big books to all of our, our, our patients. Uh, uh, we recommend them to aftercare groups that are all about the 12 steps. What role will the 12 steps play going forward? Well, they're gonna be a, a pivotal key role. Um, uh, substance use disorders are diseases of the mind, body, and spirit. And um, absolutely, uh, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous of Narcotics Anonymous, mm -hmm. Marijuana Anonymous now, are absolutely critical uh, to get well, to get into recovery. What we can provide here is that clinical stabilization that needs to occur, um, the kind of coming out of the fog that needs to happen so that people can engage in a 12-step community and can start to understand the steps and start to work them. That's what our role is, is, is to move them from that expert clinical yes. care we have into self-management. And that's where the 12 mm -hmm. steps, 12-step groups are critically important. And it's our job to introduce our patients to all that, that whole world because that's how you're gonna get well over the long term. Talking about that clinical uh, model and the role that clinicians will play, of course our graduate school is, is doing that, training that next generation. What is the role of education, uh, at, you know, uh, whether it's undergrad or, or master's degree program, what's the role of education in the delivery of addiction treatment? One of our founders, Dr. Dan Anderson, had a wonderful saying, um, and we quote it often around here, and that is, we help more people by educating addiction counselors than in treatment. Mm -hmm. um, the point being is that um, education is critical to our mission as an organization to be the leader that we are. So we need to continue to grow our graduate school. We need to continue to grow medical education to make sure uh, prescribers, understand uh, the, the dangers of opioids, for example, and what, what uh, appropriate prescribing should be. So it's, it's gonna be critically important for our mission. What about in terms of leadership um, on advocacy, on policy going forward, whether it's at the federal level in Washington or at the state level, what role does Hazel and Betty Ford play going forward in that? Well, what, what I'm, you know, look to the past, one thing I'm really proud of for the last uh, 12 years here is how our team has really grown our advocacy efforts. Yeah. So as we look into the future, continuing to build on that is going to be really important for the organization because as we say in our strategic plan, if not us, who? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, that, that is really important for us to understand. We're the largest nonprofit in the country that is focused on substance use disorders. We need to have a voice at the table. We need to be heard, and we need to have a position on these issues, like we have, for example, today on legalization of marijuana. Yes. We need to have a position we need to be heard. By the way, what is our position on our, our position on legalizing marijuana for recreational purposes is that we're not in favor of it. Um, the science of what marijuana is um, is really uh, in its infancy. It, it's not clear um, exactly how it works, what it does. We do know that we treat people with marijuana uh, use disorders. Um, it is addictive and it's particularly dangerous for young people with developing brains. We know that through our experience and so uh, we're opposed to it. Mark, you have led us through some uh, really remarkable times. We've had a couple of tough stretches during the course of the last 12 years. Here we are in 2020, You're still our president and CEO. And, uh, but, but you mentioned just in, in your previous response that we are the, the nation's largest nonprofit provider. We're not for profit. What is it like as the CEO and having the leadership team that you have, what is it like to have to manage to the margin with a mission that is as vibrant and as diverse and as important as ours? 
Well, it, it, it's always a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge for any healthcare organization because so many healthcare organizations are not tax exempt nonprofits. And um, you've, you've got to have uh, the margin. Otherwise, you cannot invest in, um, in your people. You cannot invest in making sure that you have a modern electronic health record. You can't pay your physicians and nurses and other uh, uh, important medical personnel the kind of salaries that they need to stay with you. So we really always need to be uh, following that balance and making sure that, that we're providing enough of a surplus every year to reinvest back in the organization to, to, to treat more people, to have highly engaged employees, and to make sure the families and patients are getting what they need from us. And going forward, what is the role that philanthropy will play in the sus sustaining and growing the mission of Hazel and Betty Ford? We won't be able to continue to be the leader without philanthropy. The great healthcare organizations in this country that are leading the way, uh, Mayo Clinic, um, uh, MD Anderson, uh, pick, pick your great healthcare organization, they all have just tremendous philanthropy and we need to have that also so that we can do research, that we can fund education, we can provide scholarships for uh, students who want to be a, a, a substance use disorder counselors. It's critical that we have the philanthropy because the margin from our health care services is not enough mm -hmm. to be able to uh, afford to be able to do these other very important things. We only have about a minute left, Mark. Um, so I'm going to give you the opportunity to look into the, uh, the crystal ball going forward and knowing that, that we won't necessarily hold it to you, hold Good. you to it. <laughs> but we've been around for 70 years now. This is our 71st year. You've been our president and CEO for the last 12 years since uh, 2008. Um, what do you see going forward as it relates to addiction in general and specifically Hazel and Betty Ford's role in addressing addiction? Well, addiction's not going away. Let's start with that. Substance use disorders are actually climbing right now. Um, alcoholism is climbing. Um, while the opioid, uh, uh, the, the use of prescription pain pills, thankfully, is starting to go down, fentanyl is not going down. So the, it's going to be with us. Sadly, right now, because of some of the abuses in the field, I see a major shakeout coming for the next three to five years of a lot of treatment centers closing their doors, um, a, a lot of organizations not being able to cut it. And that is not going to be a good thing uh, because we still don't have enough access to treatment in this country. Um, and a lot of the access that we have is underfunded, undercapitalized, and, and that's really unfortunate. So our role here has to be to go back to our previous comments we made here is to be that advocate out there to make sure that as this uh, turn of the wheel occurs, as we have more treatment centers go out of existence, that we're paving the way for others to open, that we're making sure that uh, we can persuade these large academic health centers, some of these large healthcare organizations to get into the business of providing substance use disorder services. Many of them aren't there today. They want to go in there. We need to help them get there because access will be critical going forward. Access, always the key to, to let other people find that hope, help, and healing that, uh, that is vital to, to the process. Absolutely. Mark Mishik, past, present, and future, thanks so much for your leadership for being with us today. Thanks to all of you for joining us, uh, along with Mark Mishik, the president and CEO of Hazel and Betty Ford. We hope that uh, you have found today's podcast to be insightful, and if you have, please uh, let your friends and family, your colleagues and your neighbors your community and know about these Let's Talk podcasts. On behalf of our executive producer, Lisa Stangle, uh, thank you all for tuning in today. We'll see you again. <laughs>